Pray with me this morning. Holy Father, we thank you for this day and we are grateful to Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit for this day that has come in front of us. God, we are grateful to see the graduates and how you've worked in their lives. We thank you, God, for the faculty, the staff, the trustees, and the students, God. We give you glory this year for the 37th graduation at Wesley Biblical Seminary. To God be the glory for great things he has done. Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to rest here upon us this day. And may this service bring you honor and glory through all that is said and done. We give you praise in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Would you lift your hearts and your voices as we sing this great hymn of Charles Wesley's, And Can It Be? I rose when forth 
Let us hear the word of the Lord. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on the earth, your salvation among the nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest, God. Our God blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray. Father, from whom all blessings flow, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We don't know how to say much more than thank you. Thank you for the renewed purpose, mission, and vision you have given us. Thank you for the renewed leadership, empowered. Thank you for current students who stayed with us. Thank you for new students who are coming. Thank you for graduates all over the world, points of light, spreading your gospel, empowered by your spirit, making a difference. Thank you for renewed confidence that you want WBS to be and to thrive. Thank you for renewed provision. Thank you for your presence in classes and chapels and halls with our online students. Thank you, Lord. We request one thing, Lord, that you will make us capable by your purpose and power to serve this present age, to accomplish your mission. And next year at this time, Lord, we will be thanking you and praising you again. Through Jesus our Lord, amen. We have a presentation to make on this occasion. I'm going to ask Dean Cockrell to escort our alumnus of the year to the platform. Dr. Cockrell. Would you welcome to the platform Reverend Timothy Masahiro Hayashi. to welcome you back to Wesley Biblical Seminary, Timothy, along with your lovely bride, Gloria. What a joy. Come, come. Wesley Biblical Seminary is proud of its many Japanese alumni and of its long connection with the Emanuel General Mission in Japan, and along with other like-minded Japanese churches. And it's a privilege today for Wesley Biblical Seminary to honor one of its own, Reverend Timothy Masahiro Hayashi, our second graduate from the nation of Japan. And it is our joy to confer upon Reverend Hayashi the honor of the 2014 Alumnus of the Year of Wesley Biblical Seminary. Since Reverend Hayashi has graduated from WBS 24 years ago, he's faithfully and effectively served the the Church of Jesus Christ through the work of the Emanuel General Mission across the nation of Japan. His ministry has included pastoral ministry, teaching, denominational leadership, and for more than 20 years he has taught at the Emanuel Bible Training College in Tokyo, Japan. 
where he also served for eight years as assistant to the president. In 1998, or since 1998, he has pastored at the influential Funabashi Emmanuel Church, first as associate and now as senior pastor. Reverend Hayashi also serves as director of the education department of the Emmanuel General Mission and as a member of the bishop's cabinet. He has ministered faithfully and in a challenging situation, leading people to Christ, discipling them, building the body of Christ, and training people for Christian ministry. Reverend Hayashi is the result of a Christian mother's influence. She took him to church, taught him, and led him to the Lord Jesus when he was 12 years old. His father had not yet come to Christ. Reverend Hayashi received his bachelor's degree and his M.A. in architecture from Tohoku University at Sendai in Miyagi Province. While at the university, as a young man of 18 years of age, he experienced the heart cleansing that the Word of God calls us to as believing children of God, the infilling of the Spirit, and God's call to ministry. Thus, after university, he pursued this call by studying first at the Emmanuel Bible Training College in Yokohama, Japan, before then coming to Wesley Biblical Seminary. After graduating from Wesley, Reverend Hayashi married Gloria. Gloria is a dedicated pastor's daughter, and together they have three children, a son, Hiroyuki, who is a graduate student, two daughters, Mitsu in college, and Yusuke in high school. Together, they have passed on a godly heritage to their children and to their family. A godly heritage that was given to Reverend Hayashi from his mother by establishing a Christian home in the island nation of Japan. No small task. Thus, our 2014 alumnus of the year and his wife, Gloria, Timothy and Gloria bear witness to Christ in their personal lives, through their family, through their public ministry, and through their perseverance, they have taken their place with the company of the faithful described in Hebrews 11, who challenge us to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. Wesley Biblical Seminary is delighted to honor the investment of our donors, our trustees, our presidents, our administrators, our faculty who invested in Reverend Timothy Hayashi, our 2014 alumnus of the year. It's a joy to have you here. We thank God for you. And I had very little to do with investing in your life. But I'm proud of you and what God's done for you. It's a joy. God bless you. Let's get another picture here. Gloria, would you come and join us for the picture? Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's a joy to have you here. God bless you. You may return. Oh, would you like to say a few words, please, to him? Please. Thank you, Dr. Naihoff, for kind, kind words of introduction and for giving me such opportunity. It is such an honor to be here as the alumnus of the year. I feel so undeserving of this award. When I announced that I had been chosen to receive this award at board meeting of our church, one of the members told me, congratulations, pastor. But for what? 
for what reason are they going to give you such an award? I couldn't answer. For some reason, WBS decided to confer this award on me. I can't think of any reason. But no reason is not a bad thing. God's grace is given to us for no reason on our side. So I decided to receive this award with deepest gratitude. I'd like to express my special thanks to Dr. and Mrs. Tashiro. I am a bad letter writer. I have written to almost none of you for more than 20 years. Because of the Tashiros, the ties between WBS and myself have been narrowly kept until now. I graduated and left here in May 1990. Dr. Tashiro came to WBS a couple of months later. So he has always been blaming me that I had run away from the seminary because of the news of his coming. <laughs> of course, that is not true. Since I first met the Tashiros in Japan about 20 years ago, they have visited us and told me about WBS from time to time. I also express my thanks to Dr. Kakaro. He helped me both in my public and my private life here. He was my advisor when I studied here. I took his classes more than any other teachers. He exemplified the seminary's strong points. Now I am trying to preach every time the word of God keeping what I learned from him in mind. I want to say thank you to my family. It is my pleasure to be here with my wife, Gloria, today. Without her support, I have not been able to work for the Lord in the church. Our three children have also supported me in many ways. My parents, who were here at my graduation, supported me financially while I was here. And they are still praying for me every day. And above all, I give my thanks to the Lord. Memories of my study at WBS make me humble. I felt a language barrier difficult to overcome. I really felt my weakness. But weakness is not a bad thing. As the Lord said to Paul, he also said to me, my grace is su sufficient for you, and uh, for my power is made perfect in weakness. When I admit my weakness, his power rests on me. Looking back to my ministry, after I went back to Japan, I don't think that I could achieve something. But I, am, but I can say one thing. When I am weak, I am strong. So I pray that the power and glory of the Lord may be seen in my ministry. As a WBS alumnus, I will continue to trust in the grace of the Lord who saved me and used many people, used me, to, uh, many people to help me for the tasks that are given to me. Thank you very much. Would you stand with me and sing How Firm a Foundation?
I just have to ask you a question this morning. Do you believe in resurrection? Hallelujah! Hallelujah. I sat about three-fourths of the way back there last year to see my son-in-law graduate from Wesley Biblical Seminary. Little did we imagine we'd be here today. I say praise Jesus for what he's done at Wesley Biblical Seminary. Our speaker for the morning has already been honored by Wesley Biblical Seminary some 10 years ago with an honorary doctorate. Dr. Hubert Harriman has been a friend of mine for a number of years. I first met Dr. Harriman when he was pastoring Ligonier Evangelical Church in Ligonier, Indiana. During that time, I would hear him at conferences and revivals as he would come and visit there at Kentucky Mountain Bible College where I was living and working. It was the summer when he had accepted the presidency of World Gospel Mission that he came to our camp meeting there, Mount Carmel Camp Meeting. I was the song evangelist, and he was one of the evangelists. And I got to really hear Dr. Harriman preach the Word of God. And it blessed and challenged my heart. He's been a longtime friend of Wesley Biblical Seminary. Dr. Harriman is a graduate of WBS with an honorary doctorate. And it is a thrill to welcome him back to our platform. He continues to serve as the president of World Gospel Mission. And under his leadership, the mission has 
come up through a very difficult time to a time in which it is now flourishing to God be the glory with missionaries, with international impact, with God's miraculous financial provision, and the experience I've watched in his life and the example of his leadership inspire me as we lead Wesley Biblical Seminary forward in a very similar time as the time in which he went to World Gospel Mission. A friend to WBS is here to celebrate Commencement 2014 and to celebrate our Masters of Divinity graduates. Hear the word of the Lord as our dear friend Hubert Harriman comes to share a message for you this morning. And I'm going to get my part too. Dr. Harriman. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Love you. Love you too. Well, this is a real honor uh, to be here for this occasion. And I know to many of you, you feel that this is really an occasion, an important one, uh, both for graduates and for those of you who have taken the cause here and have felt that God continues to lead in the days ahead. And I commend you for that and believe that God is with you and that uh, this place is needed. And may God bless each of you. There is no greater thing than the blessing of God, than to know that God's hand is on us and he is blessing our own lives and blessing the ministry that he's called us to do. And there are those of you that are part of this ministry here. And uh, I just want to say God bless you. Uh, Dr. Nyhoff, you and your wife, may God bless you for what you're doing. May you truly know the blessing of God to the trustees. May God bless you. And may you know that blessing in your lives and in your leadership with this institution. And to the staff, the faculty, uh, God bless each of you. There's no greater thing than the blessing of God. Uh, don't ever walk away from it. May God bless you. And then to you who are graduating, may God's blessing be on you today and in the years ahead. These are important times, and I pray you'll sense most of all his blessing, that God is here blessing your own hearts. And then family and friends who have joined in this time, may God bless you your part in these lives and in what is happening here today. Uh, as we come together and know the blessing of God, we ought to have a great sense of blessing in this place. And I pray that as we continue here today, we will know that deep within our hearts. This is a very formal day uh, in garb and the such. They don't call it garb. They have another name for it. But anyway, uh, it uh, is a time when you feel a little stiff standing here and wanting to bring something and hoping that we might get out of this in terms of what God wants to do and say in our own hearts here today. Uh, I didn't grow up real formal. I grew up in MK. And I can't tell you how informal that is. Uh, the only formal thing about me in my growing up years was my name, Hubert. I have a friend, Dr. Callan, who said, we've got to change your name. It sounds too formal. So he's trying to call me Hugh. But this is a formal time. A lot of things have taken place in your lives that bring us to this very important time, and we feel it. We feel that, and we don't want to get away from that. I want to read to you, and I want us to listen carefully, because sometimes the word has become too common to us. But let me read it again, 
And may the Spirit of God bring into it the feeling, the depth that he wants us to know from this passage of Scripture. It's the Apostle Paul who is writing, and it's from Romans chapter 1, and I'm going to read. I debated as to whether to read such a long passage, but nothing matters more than the foundational Word of God. And so let's look at it together. Listen to what he says. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. Isn't that great? Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. (laughs) There it is. (laughs) Jesus Christ, our Lord. Friends, that's the only reason we're here. (laughs) Through him and for his namesake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his Son is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times And I pray that now at last by God's will the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. That's a tremendous encouragement by the way is each other's faith. (laughs) We need each other. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but I have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile, For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is is written, the righteous will 
live by faith. I came across a, a newspaper article a few years back that intrigued me. It was talking about the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska, and most of us here can remember that. And uh, if you don't remember it, read about it. One of the disasters that our country faced. But this is what intrigued me. It said the average cost of rehabilitating a seal after the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Alaska was $80,000. That was the average cost for one seal, $80,000. At a special ceremony, two of the most expensively saved animals were released back into the wild amid cheers and applause from the onlookers. A minute later, they were both eaten by a killer whale. Isn't that amazing? Now, you could say a lot of things about that article. (laughs) One is, what in the world are we putting our attention on and putting our money into? But that's not the reason I read it. It cost a lot of money to bring you here. Every one of us. Those of us who are older, we'd hate to say how many thousands of dollars, thousands, have been spent on just us. We're an expensive item. Schooling alone is eating us up these days. And with all the money and all the time and all the interest that has been poured into our lives and bless your hearts, (laughs) a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of interest has gone into every one of our lives. We are here because someone did that for us. We are an expensive item. And we are being thrown out into a very dangerous world. And the tragedy that we're facing in the church today, and I see it happening within our our institutions, is that it's eating us up. question has to be asked, what's happening to us? With all that has been put into us and besides that, the grace of God itself. And we throw you out there. It's a dangerous world, young people, that you're going out into. And if you're not ready for it, It'll eat you up. It'll eat you up. We are suffering today one of the greatest losses we've ever suffered in the history of the United States as far as ministers are concerned. To different things. One being immorality. And so the question has to come. What is happening to us. Where are we lacking? With all that has been put into my life, why such great loss? Well, Paul speaks to it. We read a chapter from Romans, just chapter 1, a bit of it. But Romans chapter 1 really speaks to a life. And so it is many chapters of a life. 
by the name of a man called Paul. And he's feeling this. He is really feeling this. And I want you to feel this today. There are moments in our lives where we really need to feel things and it needs to bring us to a place of which we will speak of in just a moment. Now, we've all experienced those moments in our life when someone singled us out of the crowd. You know, they called us to give an answer in class. What's the Greek word for such and such? And we go, who, me? (laughs) You know, we've been singled out, brother, and, and we know it. But we've had those occasions in our lives where someone just called on us and we weren't sure if we were ready for it, and, and, and our mouth drops open, and we say, me? Are you, are you talking about me? Paul makes an incredible statement when he writes, Paul, set apart for the gospel of God. <laughs> Singled out, called out, and I, I can just hear him, who, Me? <laughs> you, you called me? What does it mean to be set apart? Did you raise your hand? <laughs> I didn't raise my hand very often in class. Did, did somehow it just pop up? Were you unlucky? Unfortunate? And that somehow Hubert is just not a very well-known name, so it sticks in the head. (laughs) Couldn't they find anybody else? (laughs) Are you here because they couldn't find anybody else? And then what's more, to be set apart for the gospel of God. Now, people might ask, are you a fool? (laughs) Are you a fool to respond to something like that? Especially in this day? Are you a masochist? (laughs) Are you unaware? Don't you know what's going on today? Around the world and in America? This isn't the most respected profession in the world. Not anymore. It used to be, but not anymore. Even being an evangelical today is not a respected thing. A few years back, they took a poll about 12 years ago as to what people in America felt about evangelicals. It was favorable, 65%. They just recently took that poll again, and we are down to 15%. We are not a respected group. And there are some good reasons, but it's hurt us all. We're thrown into the whole bunch. This isn't the most comfortable profession in the world. You're going to be thrown into the most uncomfortable things you'll ever face in your life. This isn't the healthiest profession in the world. They say especially ministers are very difficult when it comes to insurance. They're prone to death. (laughs) They not only bury people, they could die themselves too early. Stress is a huge factor in ministry. This isn't the safest profession in the world. When we send our missionaries out, I know that I am sending them to dangerous places But friends, we don't have to send them out to face dangerous places anymore. In many ways, the world is eating us up. This isn't the most honored profession in the world. There used to be a day when one felt honored by the people, not anymore. But to this, 
To all of this, Paul said, I am not ashamed <laughs> of the gospel. Bless his heart because it is the power of God. He saw what we must see. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And we know it, don't we? First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Now these two statements have everything to do with what Paul writes in the first 17 verses of Romans. Where he says, I am set apart for the gospel. And then he says a lot of things and then just puts another book into it, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Which, as Paul notes, had everything to do with Jesus. I've had a, a new sense of Jesus these days in my own life. And I, I won't go into the details of that, but friends, in all we are, know Jesus. Honor him. Seek him. He knew that his whole life as to where he was had to do with Jesus. Very dramatically, as we know the story of Saul and now Paul. Listen to him again. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. What powerful words. A servant. A slave. One given totally to him. He writes the book of my life and set apart for the gospel. There was a moment when he called my name and I said, who, me? The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, he had a high regard for this gospel regarding his son who as to his human nature was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through him, and for his name's sake, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And he's saying, it was all Jesus. <laughs> now, friends, this is basic stuff that we dare not forget. Verse 3, as to his human nature... The son of David. In verse 4, as to his divine nature, the son of God. Declared with power through the spirit of God. Tremendous power in that. He's the keeper of the soul. Declared with power by the resurrection. There's more to the resurrection than many of us know. And the power that is available to us, that is promised to us, in that he wants to work something in our own souls and through our own lives, in the very same power that raised Jesus from the dead. <laughs> all of a sudden, all of a sudden, being set apart for the gospel is something big. It's huge. And now it's not who, me? It's who, me? <laughs> you mean me? Praise God. In verse 5, Paul declares the enormity of his calling. Through him and for his name's sake, we 
received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes through faith. This declaration tied his calling to something that had happened many years before when the Lord told a man by the name of Ananias concerning Saul, Go! This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name among the Gentiles. And I don't think he stopped with Paul. <laughs> I think we got three right here. This was just as real and powerful to him now as it was then. He felt it as deeply as he did the first time it happened. Paul, or pull the curtain of time back and look carefully at this moment in his life. The Lord's first words to Ananias were, Go to the house of Judas on, on a street called Straight and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying. That's an interesting phrase. That God would note that he is praying. What did Pharisees do? More than almost anything else. They prayed. And they prayed a lot. In fact, they prayed more than most of us pray. That was their life, was praying. The words are intriguing because it carries the idea of, look at this. This man is praying. And friends, if we're going to face this world out here, that could eat us up, you had better know what this kind of praying means. Because again, this man had prayed a thousand and more prayers in his life, in his young life. But it seems as if God has stopped all of heaven at this point and said, I want you to look at this. This man, for the first time in his life, is really praying. I would dare say to you that one of the reasons we're being eaten up today is because we've not known this moment of real prayer. I remember a moment like that in my life, and I don't think there should be just one. Friends, things happen in our lives, and He redirects us. And many times He redirects our thinking. Many of us are thinking stupid, and He's got to straighten it out. And it happens through experiences. And when that comes and you sense it, stop everything. Everything. And pray. Because this is a turning moment in your life. This is a vital moment in your life. And if you don't acknowledge it, if you don't stop everything at that moment and say, this is a God moment. I'm not talking in the way in which we use it these days. I mean a real God moment when all of heaven has stopped and said, Hubert, this is for you. And I know it. And there's some thinking that's having to change. Like Peter himself, you don't think like God thinks. I had a 
superintendent come to our church. I was just a young pastor in my 20s. Hadn't been there but maybe two years, almost three. And uh, that makes a young pastor very nervous, having a superintendent in the sanctuary to hear you preach. A few days later, we took a trip together somewhere he was driving and uh, talked a little about this and that and all of a sudden he kind of glanced over at me and he said, Hubert, I heard you preach. Well, I knew he had. And uh, I, I was getting ready for some nice words. <laughs> you know, uh, isn't that what we do? I mean, you got to tell a person they did, they did okay. He looked over at me and he said, Hubert, I heard you preach. And uh, he said, you don't have any unction, do you? Whew. It was like a knife through my, through my soul. I didn't know what to say, and I knew I better not say anything because I'd probably say the wrong thing, and I was angry. I was angry. And uh, it was quiet most of the trip after that. I walked into the house and my wife was working in the kitchen and I told her what this man had said to me, thinking that she would support me. That's why we marry them, isn't it? So they'll support us. And she didn't support me. She just looked at me. And I walked out of the house and went over to the church and I realized that I better do some praying. I lifted my eyes to the ceiling and I said, Father, is what he said true? And I'll tell you, friends, just as soon as I asked the question, it came to my heart, yes. I was standing at the front pew and I fell on my knees and I began to pray like I had never prayed in my life. I'd prayed a lot of prayers. But I knew I needed heaven to stop. That was one moment, a very important moment, but I'll tell you, I've had others. And you got to stop. And you better pray. And let it transform your life. Let it redirect you. This would forever be the underpinning of his calling. That praying had to do with the issue of the authenticity of Jesus in his life. Is he for real or not? It had to do with the authority of Jesus in life, in his life. Would, would I let him do whatever he wants in my life? And it had to do with the authorship of Jesus in his life. Would he write his story now? Would Jesus be the one to write his story? <laughs> it takes time to write a story. It takes time to write a book takes a lot of work. And God keeps himself busy with this. And have we let him be the author of our lives? Where he writes the story. And now in this being set apart, you find words like God whom I serve with my whole heart. In preaching the gospel of his son. You find these words, I am obligated, both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. You find these words, and we've read them, but listen to them again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And in that moment, Paul or Saul at that time 
realized that this was a God moment that would redirect the rest of his life and it would be the most important day of his life. You'll have those. But find the one where you know he has full authority. You know he's real, he's authentic, and he has full authority. Let him take the pen and let him begin to write <laughs> your story. Because that's why you were created. That's why we were created. To do anything else is ridiculous. With, with this gospel? And so to all of us, we've all been set apart for this. I close with this. I was playing soccer with my young, one of my grandkids. I have 12 grandchildren. Oh, not 12, excuse me. I don't know why that figure got in my head. Eight. You can still go, wow. But anyway, uh, another one coming. We think it may be the last one, but uh, we'll have nine, the Lord willing. Four boys and four girls right now. And uh, the, the other one coming is going to hurt that. You know, it's been equal up to this time, and now it's not going to be. Unless they have twins, and we've urged her to have a boy and a girl. But anyway, I was playing, kicking a soccer ball. He was four years old, Isaiah, just a neat little kid. And uh, we were down in his parents' basement. Probably shouldn't have been kicking a soccer ball, but we were having a good time. I'd grown up playing soccer. I was born and raised in Bolivia. And so this, I wanted him to learn, you know, learn early. And uh, I'd kick it to him, and he would kick it back. And when he kicked it back, I, man, Isaiah, that, that, you're really good. That's good. Well, that put some fire in him. And so when I kicked it back to him, boy, he was ready to really go at it now. And he just stood there and put everything a four-year-old can put into that and booted the thing and... Oh, I said, wow, I say, uh, man, you can really kick a ball. Man, I, uh, I really had him on fire now. And so when I kicked it back, I mean, he got back now, and he came at that as fast as he could run, and he booted that ball as hard as he could, and then I, oh, I just took off on it. I said, Isaiah, I've never in my life seen a four-year-old boy kick a ball like that. And then he just stood there and looked at me, and he said, I was born to do this. <laughs> I want to tell you, you were born to do this. You were born to do this. Do it. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Mr. President, members of faculty, guests, and my fellow uh, students, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning and to be with you. And uh, this is an accent some of you are not so familiar with. And I was thinking just about the first time I came to the United States, which was in uh, 2001, and I was staying with a family in Pennsylvania, a lovely family. And we were out on an evening, and we stopped for some hot dogs. And I went to buy the hot dogs, and the, the girl served me. And she said to me, Sir, I would like you to, just do, to do something for me. And I said, Madam, what is, what's that? And she said, Will you stand there all night and talk to me? And I thought, Why would she ask me to do that? And she said, It's your accent. So, but, uh, but no, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. And... Uh, um, my fellow graduates, Angela, Stephen, and Sid, we are all so thankful to Wesley Biblical Seminary for how uh, you have blessed us through the wonderful teaching we have received here. 
and through the friends and the relationships that we have made. And we're so thankful for that. But most of all, we're thankful to God for how he has brought us here and he has blessed us and he has used our professors to bring blessing to our lives and to prepare us for the work that he has called each of us to. And we want to give thanks to him primarily today. Our speaker spoke at the beginning of his address about uh, the cost that is invested in, in all of us when we are educated. And uh, one of the challenges of attending an institution like this is raising the funds to, to pay the bills, etc. And I want to thank God this morning for how he has particularly blessed me in that regard over the last five or six years. He's worked in my life in in two really quite remarkable ways to provide the funds that have enabled me to complete the, my studies here. Um, interestingly, when I began my studies in 2008, the British pound was quite strong against the US dollar, so I had worked out the cost of my studies would be around 17 or 18,000 pounds. But within a few months, the, 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 um, the economic crash occurred and the British pound uh, diminished in value against the dollar, and so that figure then rose to 23, 24,000 pounds within literally a matter of weeks. So uh, I was wondering where this money would come from, but God intervened in two remarkable ways. The first one was that I had bought some shares in a small private company uh, in two th in after my own uh, uh, first degree, and a friend phoned me up just suddenly and said, George, do you remember those shares you bought in that company? And I said, yes. He said, would you sell them? I had bought them for perhaps six or seven hundred pounds. Well, my friend Gregory purchased them from me for 10,000 pounds. So that was my, the first way that God intervened. And the second way was even more remarkable. A year later in 2010, I had scheduled a meeting with a cousin in Belfast. I wanted his advice on a matter. So we met on a Monday for lunch and uh, that was fine. I told him what I was doing. We don't have a lot of contact generally through the year, but uh, so that was fine. So we left and whatever. Later that week on the Saturday, I was walking in the kitchen at home and I was thinking about the money I needed to complete my course. And I was working out mentally how much I needed. And I came up with a figure of 10,000 pounds, about 16 or 17,000 dollars. Um, about 10,000 pounds, and then I prayed, a prayer, I prayed a prayer, a little prayer, and said, Lord, you brought me to Wesley, and I'm asking you to help me to raise this money to complete the course. And I didn't think much more about it. On the Tuesday following, that was eight days after my meeting, I opened the mail, and I hadn't opened any mail for about a week. And uh, I found a letter there from my cousin, and he had written to me, and uh, reflecting on our conversation and offering me some further advice. And uh, uh, he had attached to the letter a gift of 10,000 pounds. Now, even more remarkable than that is the fact that he sent that letter on the Tuesday or Wednesday after our meeting. So the money was in my post box by the Friday, I reckon, of that week. And when I worked out the figure and prayed the prayer on the Saturday night, the money was actually in the box. I could have walked 20 paces and opened the box and lifted it out. So God had uh, worked in a quite remarkable way uh, to provide that money, and I'm so thankful to him. And uh, uh, it's, it's experiences like that that make God real. And when they happen in our lives, and they don't have to be as dramatic as that, they are a confirmation and an affirmation that he is real, that he loves us and that he is working actively to support us when we are uh, acting in his will and seeking to perform the tasks that he has given us. So I'm sure that uh, Sid and Stephen could talk of ways in which he has helped them as they have come through the last three or four years. So I want to finish by giving God all the glory for what he has done in all of our lives, and we are all trusting him as he leads us and guides us into our futures. Thank you all.
candidates for the Master of Divinity degree please stand. President Nyhoff, it is my privilege to present these candidates for the Master of Divinity degree and to certify that they have been recommended by the faculty and approved by the board to receive said degree. By the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Wesley Biblical Seminary as the President of WBS, I am delighted to confer upon you three the degree of Master of Divinity with all the rights and privileges thereof. As the names of the graduates are called, we invite family and friends to stand in recognition of your loved one. First graduate is Angela, Angela Francis Connolly in absentia, but with academic distinction. Angela's baby was due this weekend, so we allowed her to graduate in absentia. Um, Sid Carice Davis Landy. We had a lady doing that arrangement last year. They're a little bit better at it than Carl and I are. <laughs> Sid, congratulations. Look at your family back there. We're proud of you. They're proud of you. May I share a scripture with you? Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. May God bless you. Stephen Edward Kiesling. Stephen, we are proud of you. It's good to have you as my neighbor, and God bless you. Look at your family back here. <clears throat> Stephen, may I share a promise from Scripture with you from Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. God bless you. George Sidford Ruddle with academic distinction.
George, congratulations. Look here. Here to celebrate with you today. Thank you. We are proud of you, our brother. Your testimony has blessed and warmed our hearts. May I share a promise with you from God's word? You can. This is one of my favorites. Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me and for you. God bless you. The class of 2014. Graduates, you may turn your tassels to the left side. You may be seated. I have a brief charge to the graduates. You've invested a large portion of your life and your resources to accomplish this God-called goal in your life here at Wesley Biblical Seminary. May I remind you of the mission of Wesley Biblical Seminary. As you graduate from WBS, I submit to you that the fulfillment of this mission now depends upon you. Wesley Biblical Seminary exists to advance Christ's kingdom through the church and to make disciples of Jesus by offering life-transforming theological education, producing spirit-filled shepherd theologians and leaders for the 21st century who demonstrate an unwavering commitment to Trinitarian faith, Christ-centered holiness, biblical authority, and personal accountability. That is your charge. And I commission you as my brothers and sisters in the Lord. As you go from this place, lead. Lead. How do we lead? It goes back to what I've been saying last night and to the trustees throughout the week. It's really been a theme in my soul throughout this spring. Lead from a cross. You'll notice in the promises I shared with you, each of them speaks of the cross lead from a cross the Bible calls us to three simple postures toward the cross and I remind you of them the Bible calls to us to kneel at a cross in repentance the Bible calls us to die on a cross in a death to self that we might be filled with all the fullness of God and then the word of God calls us to bear the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ Kneel, die, and bear the cross. Why? So that we can celebrate our self-flagellation. So that we identify with him and make disciples of all nations for the glory of God, for the advancement of his kingdom, for the spread of the message of scriptural holiness. Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Today you exit these halls of learning. You cross a threshold into a life of dedicated service and ministry. And my word to you, my charge to the class of 2014, 
is lead. Lead from a cross. Lead from a cross. Lead from the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless each one of you. Before you stand to sing this closing hymn, May the Mind of Christ My Savior, I want to remind you that these are words of a prayer addressed to God. It is a humbling thing to open your heart as these words invite us to open our hearts, to receive the work of the Holy Spirit, for the ministry that God has called us to be engaged in and to give our lives to. So as we stand, may God the Holy Spirit enable us to pray these words even as we sing them. Would you stand with me, please? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in your perfect love, you have looked upon us at our worst and spoken the word of forgiveness to broken people in a broken world. With great joy and profound humility, we thank you for your mercy and your generosity to us. We pray that you would create in us a continually deepening awareness 
of your loving kindness and an ever-growing love for you. We thank you also for your work in making us new creatures. We ask you who are light to shine into our darkness and dispel it, to fill up our weakness with your strength, and to change our foolishness into your wisdom. We thank you especially on this occasion that you deign to give us a share in the work of your kingdom. And we rejoice in these whose lives you have claimed for the vocation of holy ministry. We pray for them that they would speak with love, wisdom, and authority that mirrors your own. We pray also that even as they speak your word, your Holy Spirit would make that same word manifest in their lives. Lives consecrated to faithfully serve you and their neighbors for your sake. We pray for your blessing to go before them, for your peace to refresh them, and your glory to rest upon them as they embody and proclaim your gospel in the world. We pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus, your Son. Amen.